Well, good evening. My name is Marjorie Forster, and I'm here with Barbara B. N. Cohn, who is our videographer, and we are here on behalf of the LGBT Center of Central Pennsylvania History Project. Today's date is November 28, 2017, and we are here for an oral history interview with Melita McCauley. This interview is taking place at the LGBT Center of Central Pennsylvania. Melita, do we have your permission to record this interview today? Yes, you do, Marge. And if I start to speak too fast, and I also tend to speak with my hands, you can tell me. We have a consent form for you to read over and sign at the end of the interview. Got it. Please say and spell your full name. Melita, I spell M as in mother, E as in echo, L as in Lima, I as in India, T as in tango, A as in alpha, Macaulay. M as in mother, C as in Charlie, Big C as in Charlie, U as in uniform, L as in Lima, L as in Lima, Y as in Yankee. Thank you. What is your date of birth and where were you born? 11 December 1952 and I was born in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. That's out near Pittsburgh, isn't it? I have no idea. We left there before I was, before my brother, who's 24 months younger than me, was born. So, <laughs> so. It's out in western PA, I know that, because we left Florida. I moved to Florida after my dad died. So. so tell me about your family and your early child development. I'm the oldest of seven children. I, have, I had five brothers younger than me and one sister. Four brothers are still alive. Um, I basically uh, raised them after my father died, and I did an awful lot of child care while my father, because my mother dealt with a lot of health issues. Mm -hmm. Just leave it at that, if you don't mind. Um, and um, I was always attracted to girls, but didn't understand why. I used to think there was something wrong with me, because I'd hear my aunts and uncles on my dad's side talking about the hard life I was going to have, so I thought I must be ugly. Um, but I understood after I figured out my sexuality that what they were talking about was, it was very obvious. I mean, my mother um, made 30 red dresses to try and get me to wear a, red, a dress, okay? Um, we would get hand-me-downs from our cousins, and um, I was always wanting to wear the boys' clothes. That's just, and today I would probably have been identified as transgender, but I'm definitely not transgender. But at the time, you know, since I had five brothers and one sister who was seven years younger than me, I thought I was just like, you know, um, I had a reading done recently with Bill Stoneman, if you've ever heard of him, and one of the things that came up was my father showed up, and apparently I used to ask where my penis was, you know? So I, I believe that just because of all the other things about my childhood. So I remember the first girl I had a crush on, her name was Maria Tiesta, and I was in second grade. Beautiful girl, olive skin. Um, but. I didn't even try to you know, figure any of that stuff out. After my father passed um, two week, a week after Christmas in 1965, and my mother was pregnant with my youngest brother at the time, and I was uh, instructed by my uncles that it was my responsibility to take care of my mother and my brothers and my sister and the baby that was coming, and they were going to move us to Florida so I could take care of my blind grandmother. So that really became pretty much my um, life. Um, I went to Catholic school my whole life, kindergarten through 12th grade, and the way it worked back then is if your family didn't have a lot of money, they would give you tuition free. Mm -hmm. I would volunteer in exchange for my brother's tuition. Um, I uh, held two jobs when I got to college. I did not go away to college. Um, my mother's brother called and reminded me that my mother needed me to stay home. So I stayed home. and. Um, my day job was working for the city of St. Petersburg in the recreation department. I was the first woman lifeguard on the beach. I was a recreation supervisor and I had um, about 100 men working for me and, and about 30 women. And uh, I could take the boys to work, my little brothers. Um, I worked my college schedule around their preschool and kindergarten because um, they were 10 and 12 years younger than me. I bought a car and one of the nuns from my high school took me to get a license because my mother didn't have a license and her car wasn't legally registered, so of course she couldn't take me. Um, and uh, I felt really lucky to be able to take care of my brothers and my sister and my blind grandmother. And I thought that's just how life is supposed to be. Um, uh, what else went on in my home I will never discuss from when my father was alive. 
other than we were told never to talk about what went on in our home. And probably a lot of people were told that. Um, so I was in, I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, and um, you know, I, you know, I loved a lot of the girls, but n the parents didn't want their daughters associating with me. I didn't understand why, you know, so it's always I don't understand why I'm being treated like this. But my security was taking care of these kids, you know, and um, taking care of my mother, who was, um, I understood after I lost my partner probably a little bit about how it felt for her, but not completely because when our father died, she had us remove what pictures there were, and we were not allowed to talk about him in her presence. And, she, and that was just how her generation dealt with grief. Um, so anyhow, I'm working the day job with the recreation department, and then also, after I would take the kids, get the kids to bed, so I get the kids homework, get the kids to bed, do laundry, blah, blah, blah. Um, I had a night job at a grocery store, um, and I was the head night cashier. And um, then I took 19 hours a quarter, first at St. Peter's Virginia College, and then at the University of South Florida. I couldn't tell you the name of anybody in any of my classes or any of my professors. Um, but I graduated with a 3.67 GPA and 23 extra hours. And I had taken care of these kids and had the two jobs and didn't have any debt. And was able to take care of a lot of expenses at home. So I went to... Excuse me, your mother was still there in the home? Yes. Okay. But my mother was best with one child. So what happened, is that, that's a good segue to explain something. So you, know, you keep hearing me talk about my brothers. Well, my sister was the perfect girl, the girly girl. And she was also a world-class swimmer. And so what my mother's journey began was to be involved with my sister's swimming. And my sister swam and set many records in grade school and high school um, and went on to college and swam on the United States team when we boycotted the Olympics. But she did go to the Pan Am Games. Her record stood for many years. And, she was, and my mother was very much a one-child person. So like when a grandchild would be born, it was hard for my siblings to understand that whoever was the youngest grandchild was where my mother was going to spend her attention. Okay. Um, I think you can kind of understand what my mother's illness was. Okay. Uh, she spent a lot of time in her bedroom. Okay. My father would come down and say, "Your your mother won't be coming down today. Um, if it's a dirty diaper, you know, I'm." I'm I'm three and a half years old. Um, if it's a dirty diaper, you can leave it till I get home at seven, seven in the morning. Otherwise, you and Joey, two and a half, know how to do it. You know how to heat up the bottle. You know how to make the formula. Yes, we can do all that. But um, so anyhow, I, I lived in a boy's world and um, took care of my brothers and my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was a little bit of a challenge. Um, like one time, one of the boys came to me and they said, Melita, Melita, Dama just put her drink in Donald's bottle. And I'd asked her to just hold him and give him his bottle while I was cooking. So I just went and got it, took her drink, took the bottle, threw it away. You know, and, and you know, because I had the two-year-old, because it was very confusing to the children what had happened to our dad, since I could only talk to them about it outside where our mother could not hear. Um, now, in her later years, she's she became much more talkative. So if you were to be sitting here talking to my sister, you would hear a much different story because my sister spent a great deal of time with our mother and had a different relationship than me. When our mother was alive, my brothers were always, you know, aghast. But she has become a saint since she died, and isn't that kind of what happens? Um, so anyhow, our, we moved to Florida. After, we had to wait till the baby was born. We had to wait till he was three months old. And because back then you couldn't fly um, with uh, infant and stuff. So um, anyhow, um, I got to take care of these kids, and so those were my children. And um, and and I got to go to a good high school and a good college, and I got a good degree. And so I get a job at the bank. Um, my uncle um, had gone to school in St. Pete because that's where his parents, my grandparents, had retired to. And so he had a very best, a d very dear friend who was vice president of the bank. And back in 1970 when I graduated from high school, or 74 when I graduated from college, um, 
women couldn't get regular jobs. So I was on a clock while my male peers were going to college, you know, were getting paid. So Mr. Prayer said to me, you're, you're really good, Molly. You should move north. And I was making less money than when I was working these two jobs, but just trying to, you know, and I'm like, i got to support my family better. So I'd applied for a job with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Because um, with my GPA, because I just needed to quit taking care of the kids. My mother needed to meet these boys. They were really good boys. I was very proud. And my mother did tell me one time, you know, we went through different phases. She said, you did a better job with them than I think I did with you and your brothers. And I don't think she did a job. I don't think any of us did a job. We turn out the way we're supposed to, I think, in spite of or because of. Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, I applied for this job with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, and in the process, apparently when I was in college, I'd taken some exams um, that showed that I had a high propensity for stuff that men normally can do, mechanical, that kind of stuff. So an Army recruiter kept calling me. And there's a few brilliant moments for my mother to stand out in my life. And um, this Army recruiter's calling, and I'm like, no way, I want to join the Army. I know nothing about the Army. So my mother says, well, who are you talking to? I said, some recruiter's calling. And, I, and she says, tell them that you're only interested if you can be an officer. Well, that means nothing to me. But her father had been on Eisenhower's staff, and so she knew what an officer was. And, he, and my mother came from a good family. So, so anyhow, I told him that. And about five months later, I get this phone call. Hi, this is so-and-so, Lieutenant Wolf. I'm with the U.S. Army, Women's Army Corps, and we're going to double the number of women from 1% to 2% in the U.S. Army. And I'm like, yeah. And we understand you want to be an officer. And um, where do you want me to put this? Right. And um, I said, well, um, I don't know. And she said, well, let me tell you a little bit about it, because you may not be interested. I said, okay. So she says, well, this is how it works. You can submit your paperwork. I'll send you the paperwork. And should your application be accepted, you have a 10% chance of being selected to go before this board in Jacksonville to see if you can get one of the slots for Florida, because we're, we're doubling the number of women, and so we need 160 women or so. And yet we're going from 1% to 2%. Well, now you're talking a challenge. I'm a very competitive person at this point in my life. I'm not anymore. And, uh, and so, um, oh, okay. She says, but that only gets you to Florida. Then you've got to get the southeastern region. And I subsequently learned after I came in the Army that each region had a different level of competition. And Florida was highly competitive. I guess a lot of women wanted to get out of Florida. So, so anyhow, I, um, I filled out the paperwork, sent it off, didn't think anything of it, and took four days to go hiking with my fellow Boy Scout leader. I had a Boy Scout troop. Back when women couldn't have Boy Scout troops. And so his father and he were legally the leaders, but he and I were the leaders so my brothers could be Boy Scouts. Um, so you so had, I, You had your fingers all over the place raising those kids. <laughs> I did this volunteer work at school in exchange for their tuition. And I was in a carpool, so anyhow. It, so I got to raise kids. So, uh, so anyhow, I fill out the paperwork, and the way the Army works, you don't hear anything, and then suddenly, you know, get a phone call. Miss um, McCulley, uh, we're very interested in having you come up to Jacksonville, and the board's going to be on this day. So I make arrangements, and it's a big deal for me as a woman to get a day off from work, you know. This isn't like the guys who get to take a two-hour lunch break at the bank, doing the exact same work I'm doing. And so, I arranged to get the day off from work, which is money for my family for feeding and stuff like that. And I get the day off from work, and I take the bus, and I go up there, and I get there, and it gets to be about 10.30 or 11 in the morning, and there's like 30 women there. And I'm like, this is such a waste of time. And they all have master's degrees. I'm 21 and a half, 22 years old, okay? Very, very young. Most of them, I think the average age was 28 of this group of women. And they have masters and PhDs. Most of them don't have any of the work experience. Many of them aren't even employed. And I've had these jobs where I've had 150 people working for me. I'm running a city district, I'm raising the kids, all this. Stuff. So, anyhow, the lieutenant comes and they said, Excuse me, lieutenant, I'm not going to be able to stay. I cannot afford to miss two days of work. And I, got, I, I, I made arrangements with someone to take care of the kids, but I've got to get back home. My neighbor's taking care of my. 
my brothers. She says, you'll be the next one to go in, Ms. McCulley, and you won't be in over 15 minutes. Nobody's been in over 15 minutes, and we'll get you on the bus back to St. Pete. And that's like a six-hour bus drive. And I said, okay. So I go in, and there's this board of three officers, you know, a colonel, and I have no idea. I remember the colonel, because um, the lieutenant, who was my recruiter, is just sitting off to the side like you are, Marge, and um, they're presenting all these, it, it, it was the, the silliest thing I'd ever been through. Because they're giving me these different scenarios. Well, I went to Catholic school, I'm worried, you know. Um, I had all these men working. I have these brothers. I'm used to men running around in just their skivvies, you know. And all these silly situations. What would you do? In, well, as a matter of fact, I've had a situation like that when I was running this pool. And one of my men um, turned the chlorine gas on and we had to evacuate the whole neighborhood, you know. And so, you know, these are just, I'm just used to responsibility. So, so anyhow, we're talking for, you know, and he says, I said, well, I was off hiking the Appalachian Trail when that, oh, you know, and so he's just going on and on with all these situations. And I'm just sitting there just being myself like I am with you, thinking nothing of it. So anyhow, an hour and a half had gone by. And um, he um, says, thank you so much for your time. This is my personal business card, Ms. McCulley. If you do not get a call, because you're exactly what we want in the United States Army. I want you to call me collect in Atlanta. This is back in the time when we had phone booths and collect calls. I said, sure, okay, thank you, sir. Thinking that he's just blowing smoke up my butt, you know? Because nobody's ever said anything that complimentary to me other than my supervisors with the city who were very impressed. You, you know, and I had to go through the normal hazing there also as a woman. So, um, so anyhow, um, I come out and the lieutenant says, Oh my God, she says, you just blew it away. And I'm just looking at her like, I, I need my bus ticket. I gotta get home. And I, and I just let it go. So I get on the bus, I come home, go to work, go see Mr. Crayer and tell him how it went. And he says, Melina, I think you really did well. And I'm just like, Mr. Crayer, I don't know, but you know, I've gotta find another job. He said, I said, because I'm not making enough money to, to help my family out and support them. Because my mother was pretty irresponsible with her money. And, and so, anyhow, a few months pass, and I get a letter, an, or a call, and I'm off hiking again for a couple days, and, um, and, and anyhow, bottom line is, I've been offered a commission in the United States Women's Army Corps uh, to report in February, I think it was. Well, I don't get, see the letter. My mother has a way of just bringing in the mail and just kind of stuffing it. So I don't see the letter until after that February date. But I call him. Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. We'll, we'll take you for the 1 May clash. Will that work? The, you know, you've got to be there 1 May clash starts to I said, sure. He said, you know, you need to go down and get commission. It means nothing to me. You know, people start saluting me. I don't come from a military family. Um, so, you know, uh, okay. So I, um, you know, I introduce my mother, you know, I'm like, the, and I tell my brothers, I want you to take really good care of mom. And they even take turns taking their day off from school to spend time with their mother. You know, I was really, really proud of my brothers at that time. And I'm still proud of them. We just don't have much contact, um, which is not relevant, I don't think. Um, it is kind of relevant, but it's not. So, because I think the more, more significant story is what I did in the U.S. Army. Um, and this is the first time I've even talked a little bit about it. Uh, so... I get there, oh, and by the way, I had to get a waiver when I put in my application because I exceeded the maximum height for women in the Army at the time, which was six feet. And it was only because I was applying to be an officer that they would allow me to come in because I signed a thing saying I would pay to have all my uniforms made, and you don't even want to know how much I spent on uniforms um, because they didn't make uniforms to fit me at 6'2". And so, so, but that was okay. So they, you, you had to pay for them? Yes. Oh. Um, but I'm an officer. Okay, so officers normally pay, but the stuff in the clothing sales store is pretty inexpensive. But be, so what they did when I went through basic is they sewed on fabric to the end of the skirt, they sewed on fabric to the end of the sleeves. Well, of course, I'm failing inspections and doing a lot of push-ups. And then for the women's fatigues, we ran masking tape from here down. And the only pair of tie shoes I own, because I wear a men's 12, um, which is a pretty big shoe for even a woman, you know, I mean, for you know, even a man. I think my dad wore a ten and a half, you know, so, um, 
So anyhow, they didn't have any combat boots to fit me because I'd gone to the WAC Center, Women's Army Corps Center in school at Fort McClellan. I was told I wasn't going to be allowed to graduate, which of course I was going to get to graduate if I didn't get shoes and boots. So my classmates, you know, helped me out because a lot of them had more of a military background. And um, we got some boots from Fort Benning, and blah, blah. And um, so anyhow, uh, I did get to graduate, obviously. And um, there were, um, but the way I chose what I was going to do in the Army, because what was happening is this was, May 1976, and the Women's Army Corps was being disestablished in 1978, two years later. And so we were being detailed to a branch for formal integration into the Army when the Women's Army Corps was disestablished. So the guys from the different branches in the Army, you have infantry, you've probably heard of, and armor and artillery. And you know, so you have the combat arms branches, and then you, we have what are called the combat support arms branches, which is like military intelligence, signal, Corps of Engineers, um, you get the chemical corps, military police, and then you have the combat service support, which is personnel and finance, AG, that kind of stuff. supply, which is quartermaster, ordinance, which is maintenance. So at that time, women couldn't go into the combat arms, and they could only serve in the um, topographic part of the combat engineers, which is maps. So they couldn't do anything, and so there really wouldn't be a future in your and so the guy gets up in, on the stage to tell us about the Signal Corps, and he shows us this video um, of these guys, and they're clumping through mud above their knees, and they're climbing these poles in blizzard-like snow. It was clear he didn't want any women. And, and you know, and he's just making it out to be just a god-awful thing. And I'm sitting there, and unlike any of my, the other 160 women, I said, that's what, I, you know, I, th I didn't think that's what I wanted to do. I thought, you know, I'd probably fit into, you know, personnel and military. But I need to do that because what if I decide I like it? And then 10 years later, I end up in that, and, and it's not really for me. So I put down Signal Corps as my first choice. And everybody is like, I can't believe you did that, Melita. You don't want to be Signal. So I did, and I got it. Um, and um, so in my class, these, there were 160 women. I was commissioned as a second lieutenant based on my physical chronological age of 23, but I had the work experience from working for the city to be um, commissioned as a captain. I'm glad I wasn't and that I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. The average age of the women in my class was 26 and a half, and the ad average educational level was a master's and nine of the women had PhDs. I just had my little bachelor's degree at the time. Um, when you fast forward to the time I retired, I was the only one still on active duty. By the time I had 10 years in service, there were only five of us left. Um, I subsequently did command, I was the first woman in the Army to command a, a tactical combat signal brigade. Um, women had commanded signal brigades and military, but not combat tactical. Um, and where was that? Um, my brigade was stationed in Germany, and I was the one who deployed my soldiers into Kosovo. Macedonia and a couple other places I can't tell you about, um, but so you know I could tell you about it now, but it's not really relevant because I'm not sure I can really tell you. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, I was a battalion commander in the first cavalry division, um, but anyhow. So let's get back to uh, get into the army and everything, and and um, I signed up for airborne school, but then I twisted my ankle, broke my ankle playing football, but. They kept re-X-raying it because they couldn't understand why my bones hadn't ossified, and it was because I hadn't finished growing, and I could have told them that. But So anyhow, consequently, I couldn't go to airborne school, but I already had orders to go to the home of the airborne, which was Fort Bragg, which had just opened to women. So I arrived at Fort Bragg, and um, they'd had a few rapes in the bachelor officer's quarters, so they didn't want to put me in the bachelor officer's quarters, they wanted me to live off post. And so I got them to give me a room in the bachelor officer's quarters, and I reported to the brigade commander, and he was so pissed. How did I get this woman? Oh my God, you know. So he tells me about the four battalions in his brigade, and he says, and then there's the 25th Signal Battalion, and it's on the other side, because remember, I'm a leg, which doesn't mean anything to you two ladies, but in the Army, if you're, air, if you're at an airborne post, you need to be airborne. You don't need to be a leg without wings that you can jump out of an airplane. So here I was, because of my broken ankle, even though it had healed without a cast, which is a whole other story. Again, going back a little bit to being a woman um, in a world that doesn't really 
isn't really ready to welcome us because I'm my classmates are the first class are West Pointers, and um, I outrank the West Pointers because the way they commissioned us is they did battlefield commissions, so we don't take the. There's a law that nobody who graduates from ROTC can have a date of rank senior to a West Pointer if they are commissioned within 45 or 60 days. But battlefield commissions don't count. So I outranked all my West Point um, classmates, so I was in charge of them in school. So, so anyhow, I get to my brigade commander and he says, so there's like eight of us reporting in, seven guys and me. And they immediately get their assignments. And then he offers me this job as the assistant public affairs officer. There is no such position. And says, you know, goes on and on. I said, no, I want to be a platoon leader because, again, suppose I like being in the Army, then I need to do what you need to do to become, uh, you know, a successful Army officer. So he says, well, we have one unit. It's called the 25th Signal Battalion. It has the highest crime rate on Fort Bragg. We have eight walking 82nd Airborne Division MPs to patrol it. It takes all the court martials east of the Mississippi. Remember, this is 1977 now, January 1977. So we're still dealing with the end of the draft, even though the draft had ended several years ago. So, that, you know, so you're, inter you know, I'm interviewing the soldiers in my platoon when I finally get. So, so anyhow, he sends me to lunch, tells me to come back, I come back, and he says, um, "So, how was your lunch? Great. Um, so, how about that a public? No, I want to be a platoon leader." Okay, I'm going to send you to the 25th. You remember, and I rehashed to him the, his whole speech about it being on the other side of the rail tracks, crime, you know, Article 15 day office. So I go down there, and the battalion commander and the XO are like, oh my God, where did she come from? You know, how did we end up with her? Because that unit to, only had officers who were West Point Airborne Rangers, except for like one person who might have been OCS. Because of, remember, it's the high crime. It's got all the guys that have been court-martialed. Um, so, so anyhow, it's like, oh, so what am I going to do with her? He says, look, I've got this job as the assistant personnel officer. Um, no, I want to be a platoon leader. So what he tells me to do, and, and this is really relevant to our whole story, I think. He says, I want you to go home, and when you come back in the morning, we'll talk. So I come back in the morning. And he says, um, so what do you, I want to be able to do. Okay, then you're going down to Charlie Company, and they're going to the field this afternoon. So remember, I got in that room at the BOQ. So I go to the field without any field gear, okay? And I'm in the field for like five days, and, in, and my platoon sergeant is pitched like, the F did I do to end up with this female lieutenant? So, so anyhow, he won the prize. And everybody's making fun of my company commander because he got stuck with the female, you know? And so it's like the big talk in the whole battalion. So let's. Um, so I come back and you know my my stuff has been put in a storage locker because I wasn't in my room and they rented it out to somebody else and all that. But um, you remember that brigade commander that I told you about? Five months or six months later, it's June, and we're out in this major exercise, and the corps commander is telling everybody. In, in the Corps that they need to go down to the 25th Signal Battalion at Site X at such at this great coordinate and see this female lieutenant, you know, in action. You've got to go see her. And so the joke in the battalion, we had 1,300 soldiers on our battalion, was if we charged a quarter for everyone who came to see Lieutenant McCulley, we could have had a steak and beer, remember we still drank back then, dinner for every soldier in the battalion. That, that was the parade that came through. And that's relevant to another story I'm going to tell you. So, so then, a couple weeks later, my battalion commander calls me into the office and says, Colonel Nelson, that's, who subsequently became General Nelson, his son is an ROTC cadet, and he wants his son to shadow you for his two weeks of AT. Oh, okay. I so the prime example of what people should be doing. And then, um, so, and we've probably run out of time by now, but that's okay. Aren't you out of time? I don't even know what time it is. No, we're fine. Okay, so so anyhow, you remember the story about the um, the corps commander. Okay, so that's relevant um, because remember I told you how I was taping my uniform. Right. So um, a few months pass, and um, the big commander of the Women's Army Corps is coming to Fort Bragg, and she wants to meet with all the women. And Fort Bragg is one of the two largest posts in the U.S. Army and in the world as far as military posts. The other is Fort Hood, where I was battalion commander. 
And um, so all the women are over in the core support area on the other side of the highway. Um, Fort Bragg has a major highway that goes through it. And so, uh, so anyhow, um, the brigade commander and battalion commander tell me I have to go to this thing at the theater. So I go over to the core area and I go to this. And so she gives her little spiel and she asks me any questions and I raise my hand and I say, yes, Second Lieutenant McCulley. I don't know my brigade commanders in the audience. Second Lieutenant Malia McCulley, ma'am, and I think these fatigues that you've given on women to wear should be sent to Africa. They're totally non-utilitarian and the, the oil and grease in the motor pool just gets absorbed into the uniform unlike the men's uniforms. They don't fit us right. You know, they're not, the, they're, they're not, they don't protect us. They're supposed to be a protective, our, our fatigue uniform, and now we wear battle dress and desert camis, they're supposed to protect us. In fact, it, my later uniforms had radar screening in them, believe it or not. So, uh, you know, this is a totally in, unacceptable uniform. And she says to me, Lieutenant, be at ease and take your seat. Okay, I guess I shouldn't have said that. But, you know, I'm just a second lieutenant, right? So, anyhow, I'm walking out of the theater and I see my brigade commander and I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm really in trouble now. So I, and I'm supposed to go have dinner with this general. So I get in my car and I race over to my battalion before going home to change my clothes to tell my, but my battalion commander's gone for the day. So I go home, nervous as shit, get myself changed to go to the dinner. I get to the dinner and there's like 20 women officers. I don't know any of them because they're all from the other end of, you know, the part of post where women are and not where I am, which is, remember, the highest crime and all this stuff. And she looks at me and she says, I don't want to hear a word out of you, Lieutenant. Okay, fine. So, the next morning, I, I, I'm waiting at the battalion headquarters for my battalion commander to show up before physical training. It's like, it's still dark. It's like 5.30 in the morning. You know, we do more before 9 o'clock than the rest of the world. So, so anyhow, I tell my battalion commander, I said, sir, i got to talk to you. I did something really bad yesterday. He says, oh, Colonel Nelson called. And General uh, Emerson um, asked if we could have you on standby. General Emerson's the Corps Commander. Remember, he had everybody pray because he's going to be meeting with General Clark and he's going to address your concern about the utility uniform because you're absolutely right. And he wants you on standby in case General Emerson has any questions for you or needs you to come up there to further explain this to General Clark. General Clark being the woman in charge of all the way. Okay, so I'm on standby, never hear anything. Several months later, my platoon officer, platoon sergeant, comes to me and he says, Ma'am, there's some major on the phone from the Pentagon that wants to talk to you. And, you know, when you're at that level in the Army, you're like, the Pentagon's calling? So, yes, uh, second lieutenant. Yes, this is Major so and so General Clark's going to be traveling, and she'll be about four hours from you. But if you have any other suggestions for her, she'd be happy to come to Fort Bragg and meet with you, Lieutenant McCullough. No, I don't have anything else. Because what, and, and, and that, but the next morning after, you know, she had met with General um, Emerson, I forgot to tell you that, a message came out from the Department of the Army announcing that the women could wear men's fatigues. And so I was like, I, I did that. So, um, so um, throughout that whole assignment, I was cat called my very first time on staff duty. They put me on staff duty. And this is relevant because this went on until when I retired, believe it or not. So. I'm on staff duty and they gave me payday night and payday night's pretty rough because most guys like to, you know, this is, we're going back in the 70s, it's not the all new volunteer army where we have much more mature kids like when I was a battalion commander or brigade commander and, you know, so I'm busting kids for smoking pot and for, you know, and I'm busting a rape and somebody spray paints my car and puts sugar in my gas tank and, you know, and all this, and and then I walk into this one barracks, remember this is the highest crime rate, and there's these guys all pacing, it's an open bay barracks that you've probably seen stuff like, a scene like that in the, or in the movies. And, um, and there's this one guy pacing back and forth, and I've been assigned two bodyguards, two great big burly NCOs to protect me. And of course we have the eight MPs that are patrolling. Well, I tell everybody to get in their bunks, and I tell this guy who's acting like a crazy guy that he needs to get in his bunk. So he hauls off and hits me and knocks me on the ground. My bodyguards run away. They leave. I bounce up instinctively. Remember, I've grown up with five younger brothers. I had all these men working for me. And I just instinctively, and the guy's bigger than me, go back up and hit him, you know, and just push him back. And everybody's like, what the shit? Did you see that, what that lieutenant? Because no lieutenant would do that. But, you know, 
I'm kind of a little bit street smart, I guess, but I'm very naive. I still haven't figured out my sexuality. You notice I'm not mentioning anything about that. So, um, so anyhow, um, nothing, you know, nothing, I had to go file an MP report and stuff, and nothing happened to this guy for assaulting me, and I always felt it was because I was a woman. I was told, don't worry, he, we're putting him out of the army. He got in a fight in the mess hall, and he had a couple guys with a meat cleaver, and he got hit in the head, and, you know. This is the 1970s. This is not the army of the 1980s, 90s, or 2000s, you know. Because um, I retired in January of 2005. So I've been retired just about 13 years. I haven't worked since Labor Day of 2004. Because um, I had a lot of what we call terminal leave and, and, and stuff. A lot of leave I lost, too, because of... But anyway. So, um, so anyhow, but guys would catcall me and stuff like that. And when I moved here, it was my 23rd move of over six, where I was going to live over six months. And I've now lived here longer, as of like a couple weeks ago, than any place in my entire life. Um, and it's a whole other story how I ended up here, other than spirit brought me here. It had nothing to do with a person, because um, I was trying to refine myself here after losing my partner. But, um, but I, I, um, so what would happen to me is, like about a year and a half later, um, they needed some women to send to Europe to expose men to women. And because I'd been working in this unit, I was sent to Europe. So I moved around a lot more than my male contemporaries, just so that guys could have the experience of being assigned with a woman. You know, like a little chemistry experiment, I guess, or something like that. Sensitivity. But, um, but and in each case I was not welcomed, but in the end, I earned their respect. Um, so I don't, you know, I could, there's many stories I could tell about my time in the army, and I would prefer that you say, you know, um, to tell you that despite all of it, I'm very proud of all that we accomplished. Um, and, um, you know, my unit had no deficiencies every time we deployed, unlike any other unit. My men, we won the all army awards for re retention. Um, and they, the number one place they wanted to re-enlist for was to stay with my unit. We won the uh, best maintenance in the Army awards at every level that I served in, but in, my, in the beginning I was given the worst units to command. For battalion and brigade command, um, a general officer came to me when I was selected for battalion command and he says, because I was going to the unit he had commanded, and he was very, very upset that I was going to that unit because it was unspoken that I was a lesbian. And so they really, you know, it really was very disturbing. So I, I guess I should, how I figured out that I was a lesbian? Do you want to know, I mean, or do you want to know more? Sure. Um, it was my soldiers. My fe there were a fem few female soldiers. And as, wherever I served, I was always the senior woman, except for a few months um, of the end of my brigade command tour when a woman general came in to take over the command that I, at my higher headquarters. Um, but then when I went to be the uh, deputy commander for Signal in the Army, again, I was working for men. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, but it was my soldiers who realized who I was, but I did not realize who I was. So did they talk to you about it? No, they just said, it? come on, we're taking you, Lieutenant. You need to go out and learn how to have fun. I never partied in high school. I never partied in college. Remember, what did I tell you I was doing? I was taking, taking care, care of kids. Care. So I had had no social life. Um, my friends joke that, you know, since I retired, I've been doing the playing I never got to do as a kid. Um, and, and that's a whole other story, because what I do now is I volunteer with my dogs, and, and we're, we, they're th certified therapy pets, all the ones that are at least 12 months of age. And we work with the veterans with PTSD and in the hospice at the VA and with special needs kids, and with kids at the Hershey Children's Pediatric Rehab Center. And that's become my passion in how I've redefined my life um, since I retired. Um, but, so anyhow, they tried to help me see that. And then um, when I was visiting one of my soldiers, and this is where my pet Central Pennsylvania connection comes in. So I'm visiting one of my soldiers in the psych ward, and what happens sometimes with soldiers when we send them overseas on their initial assignment is some of them are just, although they're very mentally stable if we'd left them in the United States, sometimes it's just too much to send them overseas. 
So I'm visiting him up in the psych ward of uh, 97th General Hospital, and um, this psychiatric tech, who is an enlisted soldier, verboten for an officer, makes a pass at me, and long, I fall in love with her, you know? And she's from Boysville, Perry County, and her name is Rochelle Grogan. And we recently reconnected this year, as a matter of fact. Um, and um, so we had, you know, a, a relationship of sorts. It, it wasn't, you know, we had to be very discreet and, because she was enlisted and living in the barracks up in Frankfurt and I'm a, um, a company commander with 330 soldiers, or 360 soldiers, 360 soldiers. Um, and uh, yeah, you had to be very, very careful. And, but um, she was a pretty loose girl and she'll tell you that. And so she got involved, you know, I, I made friends with, at this point I've now come out enough that I'm connected with the other lesbian officers. But unlike them, I'm not doing some of the things, because remember I've been pretty much a buttoned kid, so I'm not going out to the bars and, and doing stupid things and getting caught. So I'm never under investigation. So Rochelle, I catch her in bed with one of my friends, and you know, it's just, the tip, it's just a bad situation. But I'm still in love with her because she's my first love, and you know how your first love is. So um, I, I end up coming back. I finish my company command tour. I come back to school at Fort Gordon. Um, try to, and she's gotten involved with my best friend at the time that I'm going to share an apartment with. And so that's just a, a crazy situation. So, um, you know, that tip. And so I'm like, I don't want to deal with any more of this lesbian stuff. So my next assignment after I finish all my schools in Georgia and Virginia, is to go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. So I go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. I've sworn off ever getting involved with anybody because I don't like the drama of the lesbian community and maybe I'm just supposed to be single, right? And um, so I'm, I'm pretty close to one of my male peers and he and uh, this other male peer in another unit, um, so he is dating a woman named Joe Carol Terry who later becomes my partner. And, um, and I have a friend, Michael, who is good friends with Sharon, my best friend who had cheated on me with Rochelle. And um, so Michael and I go to the military ball, and JC and Scipio go to the military ball. And JC had quite an alcohol problem at that time, because she hadn't figured out who she was. Um, and in the Army, if we came out, you know, we would have been kicked out, not even with an honorable discharge back then. I mean, this was really, and, and a lot of our peers were being investigated. So I've got all this drama behind me, and, um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about her, because she was the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life. She helped me become comfortable in my skin as a woman, and she really helped my family a great deal. And it was very traumatic on all of them when she got sick and, and then subsequently died. But especially on me, of course. And so, so anyhow, um, so she made a couple passes at me and she asked me to, she was getting promoted to major. She was um, about five years older than me. And so she was a little bit senior to me, <laughs> to say the least. And um, so technically, once she got promoted to major, we weren't supposed to be hanging out either. But at least we were in the same unit. So. Um, so anyhow, um, we, we, um, so she invites me back to her house. She invites me to her promotion ceremony and, and of course, Skip. And then she invites us both to her promotion party. And so I, um, I tell Skip, and he says, yeah, let's just go. So Skip and I go to the promotion ceremony, and it's real nice. And, and, he, and I said, I'll meet you at the party, you know? And, um, because at this point, you know, he's pretty much given up on dating her, but he still cares about her, you know, and he knows her very well. Well, I get to the party earlier than him, and, and she and her unit have been partying for hours, probably, you know, for several hours, and so everybody's pretty loose. And um, her sister's there, her mother's there, and I walk in, and she puts her arm around me, and she's introducing everybody to me as her lady. And I'm like, i got to get out of here because she's in a military intelligence unit, her brigade commander's there, her battalion commander's there. Boy, but she had slept with so many guys that nobody took her seriously, thank God. And she'd been a debutante, and if I read it, she was not even, she should have had a waiver for being too short. She stood on her tippy toes to be five feet so she could get in. So you can imagine what we look like walking around. 
because she was barely five feet tall, and I'm six foot. And and I'm a kind of a you know I was kind of a goofy girl at the time. You know she really polished me off. So so anyhow, um, I'm like I didn't get out of here. I don't belong at this party. Should I tell her I've got to leave? So uh, she wants to walk me out, and she she and she kisses me, you know, in the parking lot. Now. And Skip's coming in, and he says, "What's going on?" I said, "I got to go." And he can tell by the look on my face something bad has happened. He says, I'll meet you at 5.30 tomorrow morning before any of the guys get in. So I spill my guts to him and tell him what has happened. Because in the Army, we're like brothers, you know? They don't see me as a girl. They just, you know, once they get to know me, they just see me as another one of the guys. He says, well, you've got to stay away from her. She's just bad news. She's got an alcohol problem. I went to take her out, and she was passed out, blah, blah, blah. So... Um, so anyhow, she, she calls me up and asks me to come over, and long story short, I end up, you know, um, spending the night with her, and she says, don't expect this to ever happen again, and, and we were together for the rest of her life. So, and because she was so good at what she did, with getting back to the Army, and I was so good at what I did, and she had slept with so many men before I came into her, her life, and she was such a foo-foo girl, um, Nobody believed that there was anything going on other than what we would tell people. That we shared a place, because she had pretty, pretty more administrative type assignments in the intelligence corps, and I was, had muddy boots, so she could watch my cats, and because um, I always had animals, and I could take care of her stuff when she would be on travel using suitcases and airplanes and stuff like that. And she did do some muddy boots, but not quite like me, and she didn't want to do it like me. So, um, so anyhow. Um, because we were so good, we were always able to get stationed together. Um, and it was, we did better than people in the married army. But at this her. point, you were just roommates to everybody. Yes. And we, so how did you manage to get stationed together? Okay, so the, the first time, um, I, I, was, I, I, I was really pretty good at what I did. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we had our first assignment together when we met. And then... Um, I'd been there like 18 months, and I was handpicked to go to this special assignment in D.C. Um, and uh, I was just like devastated because I was going to have to leave this love of my life and everything. But she'd been selected for this next higher school. So we worked at, uh, neither of us ever felt we had any future in the Army. So we'd, we, we had done the course for the school out in Kansas by correspondence. So we arranged for her through my assignment officer, who, you know, was unspoken and because I wasn't blatant like the other women. Um, so he arranged for her to go to the school in Norfolk. I was stationed in Washington, D.C. We were living in Springfield. Um, and then because her grandmother was elderly and she was taking care of her grandmother, we worked a deal with his help. Um, and he subsequently retired as a two-star general. So, you, you know. Um, it, but to, he still thinks you're roommate. No, he, but he knew the truth. Okay, that's he knew the truth. So that's the thing you got to know is, as long as you didn't put it in their face like a lot of the other women, and you, you know, would put on the dress. I mean, yeah, so an example. One time I'm at this affair, and I'm in a skirt, you know, linen suit, you know, all dolled up. Um, I don't even own any skirts anymore. And um, standing in a receiving line for a three-star general, and one of my majors looks at me with his wife, and he says, man, you clean up right nice. And his wife slaps his face, you know? <laughs> Don't talk to the colonel like that, you know? And, and they'd all look at me like, man, you have legs. And JC used to talk about my legs because I'm a fairly attractive woman. I don't try to be attractive, but and, you know, she said I was. And, and that's really all that mattered at the time. Um, but so, so what we did, because we played the game, um, and because we would have them into her home, and we were so open about living together instead of hiding the fact we were living together, and we were both great chefs, and we loved to entertain, and we were always having people over, just like I just did for Thanksgiving, um, it was okay. I was never really accepted by my peers. What was interesting, it was two grades above whatever I was accepted me for who I was. My female peers had a real problem with me, and my male peers, their wives had a problem with me. Um, and that was because I spent more time with their husbands, 
And I saw their husbands in situations that you would not normally see a man in. Because, because I spent most of my time in the Muddy Boots Army, suffice it, and it wasn't the same Muddy Boots Army as a lot of these other women were in, suffice it to say, we even did gang showers together at times, you know? But could I even tell you what a penis looked like? No, I couldn't other than from a picture. Because I had three minutes to get that shower, I had my clothes, I wanted to get my shower, and I wanted to get out of there, if that makes sense. Because um, that's just how it was, you know? Um, so I never really thought about it, okay? Um, because I had no interest. I believe there's a, a continuum, and I believe I'm on the continuum where I've just never even looked at a man like that. Where I have lesbian friends who have been married, who took a while to come out, and who were able to be comfortable with a man but are more drawn and attracted to women. Um, I have some very close male friends. I have a lot of, unlike my lesbian friends I have here, I have more straight friends than I have lesbian friends, just because I can get along with just about anybody. Because I identify, the happiest thing about being retired is being able to acknowledge who I am. Um, don't Ask, Don't Tell was great for us because at least nobody could ask us any longer. Um, the hardest thing sometimes was with my soldiers when you know, one of my subordinate commanders wanted to kick somebody out for being gay, and I, as the court-martial convening authority, had that approval authority, and it was a, it, it was a moral dilemma for me, you know? Um, because at that point under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they could get an honorable discharge. And so I would, question, I would have to be very careful how I question them, you know, because I couldn't expose myself, even though it was pretty obvious that the colonel had L tattooed on her forehead, you know? Um, so if they acknowledge themselves as being discharged, gay, so the, the crime was acknowledging. After Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, the crime was being caught, or anybody reporting, and then they would do a, an investigation. So they were always investigating the lesbians and gays. Um, but I will tell you, so, what did, so an interesting story about my uncle. So my uncle, um, a wonderful man, uh, and he says to me at one of my brother's weddings, he says, so my lady, you're still in the army. I guess we have nothing else to talk about. I guess not, sir. Because for him, he served in Korea. My dad served in World War II. Women that went in the army were one of two things. They were lesbians or prostitutes, you know, you know very loose women. Um, when I came in the army, a woman who got pregnant was automatically discharged. With an honorable discharge, we paid all her pregnancy stuff. Shortly after that, she had the option of staying or not, but she had to have a family care plan. And, and it was not easy to stay in if you had a child. Um, when I went through training at Fort McClellan, the men that were there as our instructors to teach us orienteering and all the ranger stuff, which of course I got into and none of the other real women really did, and I think it's just how I'm wired, to be honest. Um, it was a hardship assignment because it was such a, you know, because of all the women that were there and most of them were lesbians, even though, you know, and, and you know, that's, it was just an unspoken thing, but there were always all these investigations going on. What's very interesting is all our friends get investigated. Ask me if JC or I were ever investigated, and I will tell you we never were. And yet, you know, when we, would, we both had security clearances that gave us access to even presidential stuff, okay? We'll leave it at that. And because there's all kinds of security clearances, and it's based on what you have a need to know. So you know in those security clearances it came out, but there's this rule I don't know if it's a rule or a law, if JC was alive, she could answer the question for you because she was in the intelligence court, where they can't ask lifestyle questions. Okay, so they can't ask. So even if it comes out, so they, they might interview all of our neighbors, you know? But if our neighbors have never witnessed us kissing or holding hands. Yeah, now, what was very interesting is, you know, like, um, my male superiors would say, and even our neighbors, you know, wherever we lived, would say, you two are better friends than any married couple. <laughs> and when she got sick, she had a disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is not related to smoking. It does the opposite to your lungs of emphysema. And so you basically suffocate. And there's no treatment for it 
other than a transplant. And so she ended up being medically retired, and the Army paid for her to get a lung transplant. So at the same time, all that's happening, I'm a brigade commander in Germany. And, and we're seeing each other more than married couples, even though she's living in the States and, and flying back and forth, and I'm flying back and forth because of my position. Um, and I'm also flying all around the combat theater, because I had soldiers at like 31 different locations. Um, because the way we deploy in combat communications is in anywhere from teams to platoons to companies, but we don't form a brigade formation like in an infantry division. So, um, so anyhow, um, she went down really, really fast, and so when I, so I'm finishing up my brigade command tour, and I'd been selected for this position out of Fort Huachuca, which is a mile high, which is a very hard place to breathe, as you can well imagine. And, uh, Colorado? No, Arizona. Arizona. It's um, about five miles from the uh, Mexican border, 85 miles southwest of Tucson. And she'd been there for the intelligence center in school, and she just loved it. And it was her dream to go back there. So isn't it kind of neat that I'm getting a sign there? So, um, so anyhow, we were able to... Um, so I explained to General Rush, because when I got se to be senior, like as a brigade commander, I was entitled to family quarters. Well, I couldn't live in those family quarters because then she wouldn't have been allowed to visit me more than 30 days a year um, because she's not a, a blood relative, okay? So, um, I forget, you know, it, it's not really relevant, the stories I would tell to be allowed to live off post, but when General Russ elected me to be his deputy out of Fort Huachuca, there's also a set of quarters for that. I mean, if you were to drive into Fort Huachuca, even on 9-11, my picture was in the MP guard, sh in the guard sh gate shack. You know, as, you know, like the, the, the who. And I'll tell you a funny 9-11 story if we have time. But if I don't, it doesn't matter. You don't need to hear the story. But um, so anyhow, the, the, he said to me, Melita, you need to live off post. He says, no problem. And I said, you know, JC, and he was the one that had gotten JC and I signed together in the beginning. He said, JC's very sick, sir. He said, when you get the phone call, you just go. And he would work my TDY. And, and my aunt, who's my mom's sister, was also very sick. It got sick about the same time. And, um, and she had a, a son who had a drug problem. And so I was responsible for both of them. Time to finish? No, okay. Oh, okay. So, so, I'm allowed to? <laughs> so, so anyhow, I was running back and forth taking care of both of them. Now, at this point, where was your partner? Okay, so um, so when I returned from Germany, I got her medically retired and everything like that. Okay. And um, at that point, she needed to go on oxygen. We flew out to Arizona, found a place, got her on oxygen, and um, she, she got um, shingles in her um, esophagus. Um, and I thought she was going to die, and she thought she was going to too. And so I took her on sick call to Walter Reed, and um, I said, you know, and, and I talked to her pulmonologist, and he says, Melita, you know, I know that the diagnosis you normally have a year or two years after diagnosis, I don't know if she'll make it till the spring. And so one of the things that she'd had the presence of mind to do, she had a buddy who had, had been diagnosed with prostate cancer who worked where she worked. And, um, and um, he had suggested that she call Johns Hopkins to get a second opinion. So she called Johns Hopkins, and, 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 um, and what happened, well, so, so go backwards a little bit. So go to May of 2000, I'm in command, and she's had pneumonia four times that year. So, and so anyhow, she, she, we decide that it's better for her to have the biopsy without me and have me there for the results. So I'm there for the results, then we go and get the second opinion. Only Johns Hopkins said, you need to go to Anova Fairfax, which was like 15 minutes from our house. There's a doctor there doing a study on IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We go to see him, and, but unfortunately, Walter Reed had done the biopsy, and, and so she couldn't get into the study because they hadn't done the biopsy, and you know how that stuff goes. But he said, you know, I can also do a transplant on you. But she didn't even want to talk about that because that really meant she didn't have much time. So now, that's, this is ju now July. So we fast forward to the end of November, I'm home from Germany, and I said, we gotta go over and see Dr. Nathan, let's just go. 
So we went over to see Dr. Nathan, and unbeknownst to me, Dr. Nathan had a gay brother. So he knew not to ask me the question about my relationship. But he knew that I would take care of her. So, so the normal process, so I said, I really want to see if she can qualify. He says, well, it normally takes about six months to go through the whole process. I said, I'm going to be in Arizona on the 2nd of January. You know, Thanksgiving is next week. And he says, um, well, we'll see what we can do. So he scheduled us for, it was after Thanksgiving, yeah, because she, she'd organized a family reunion for my family. So, so this first week of December. So the second week of December, we go over to Anova Fairfax, and we go through this whole battery of interviews. I go in to see the psychiatrist, and, and you'll laugh because of this study. And um, they said, so what is your relationship to her? Because we need to make sure she has someone who can be her medical advocate, and make her decisions, keep track of her medications. And I managed a spreadsheet that had 28 meds at, at a high point with six different administration times. Because when you get a transplant, you're trading a terminal illness for a managed medical condition. And at that time, in 2001, the life expectancy for somebody with a lung transplant, the most exposed organ of the body, was about a year to five years. Okay? And, and over Fairfax have better survival rates. And so we followed all the rules, all the rules, and, um, she, and everything. Um, oh, so anyhow, we go through the whole interview process, and then I make arrangements to get oxygen to take in the car, and she wants to go see her family and explain to them that I'm going to be making all the decisions because her family didn't accept me because they thought I had corrupted her and she had been the one that made all the passes at me as you can kind of figure out. And, um, and that they were going to have to tolerate me if they were going to get to see her because I was going to be the one that made all these decisions. So um, five days we go through this whole battery of tests and and I explained to the psychiatrist, don't ask, don't tell. And so they, I say, I will take care of it, but we can't discuss it. And so, because if I had acknowledged to them that we had a lesbian relationship, I would have been kicked out of the Army. She would have been kicked out because she was getting ready to be met. We would have lost all of our pension, pension and everything, you know? Um, which just isn't right. Uh, so, so anyhow, it's the 20th of December, and she's had several other medical scares, as you can well imagine. We've had to sw switch to a different oxygen company. She's now on four liters per minute. Home oxygen can't go above six liters. I don't know how much you know about medical stuff. I learned so much. So, but, and, and so I, she wanted me to have these signs on the side of the car, because nobody, you know, because of all the oxygen I was carrying, because I was carrying portable oxygen. I was carrying frozen oxygen, and I was carrying, so I could regenerate tanks for her, and I was carrying a concentrator, which is something you can plug into the wall to generate oxygen. Um, so um, it's the 22nd of December. Snow, ice, and we've got to leave, because I want to get her to her family to at least see them on Christmas, because I don't think she, I know her diagnosis. And um, the 23rd, I wake up and they call. She's been approved for a transplant. And I'm like, oh, you know, God is with us. And um, it, they said, but it'll take TRICARE, that's our medical mm -hmm. that we have in the Army, at least 45 days to approve it. And the average wait is 13 months. We don't have 13 months, but God is with us. Remember how small I told you she was. So, um, so anyhow, um, we, uh, I, I get the oxygen, I get everything, I pile in the car, and we leave the morning of the 25th with the good news that she's going to get a transplant. And, um, and there's a blizzard coming, and I'm, I'm driving in front of this storm. And um, we stop at her family's to visit them, and of course we can't even stay at a hotel in town because, you know, I would have been shot. And so, so she visits them, and, and they're very cordial to me and everything. And, and fast forward to today, and I am so close to her great nephews, you know. Um, I have a better relationship with her great nephews than I do with my own siblings. Um, and they don't care because they get it. Um, but it's their generation, I guess. Yeah, so so um, I drove to Arizona in four days, which was record-breaking time because there were different people she wanted to see. She wanted to see her Uncle Joe in Katy, Texas. You know, and I didn't know if she was ever going to get to see these people again. You know, um, And then we arranged, my boss and I, for me to fly back 
I made arrangements with some friends for her to stay with them because she couldn't stay by herself. And um, I flew back to do an inspection on something that we have that's here in Pennsylvania that you may have read about. Um, but it's a special facility for the president. And among other things, my soldiers were responsible for that. So, you, you know, when you would see the pictures, photos, courtesy of the U.S. Army with the green border, those were my combat camera soldiers. Um, you know, the, the, anything to do with communications, my soldiers did that. Be it Kosovo and Bosnia, Iraq and Afghanistan, all over the place. Um, and I had 18,000 of them working for me in my last assignment and a budget of a billion dollars. Um, who would have thought this mixed up girl would have got to that point? Um, I had 23 full colonels working for me. And although I was a full colonel, I was serving in general officer position. Um, the reason I didn't get promoted, a four-star general that I worked for, flew out to Arizona to tell me um, that he had fought my case. And I said, I understand why. And, and it had to do with me. There are lesbian generals, but Melita didn't care what people thought. You know, do you, if I just am going to be my genuine self, and that's just who I am. And quite frankly, you know, I, I had all the privileges of a general officer, but I didn't have to meet the plane with all the bodies coming back from Iraq. Um, I uh, was in there to brief why we shouldn't go to war. I saluted and came back and told the soldiers why we were going to go to war. Um, but I remembered what I'd been taught as a second lieutenant by these guys that had been in Vietnam, and that is to vote with your feet. We were put under stop loss when the war, ended, when the war began, 9-11, um, and although we told them we needed to go to Afghanistan, George W. Bush, and this is now unclassified, only wanted to go to Iraq to avenge some stuff to his father. I was locked down for about five days um, when 9-11 happened, and JC needed all her medications, and it was my admin assistant who took them to her, because she wasn't allowed to come on the report, even though she was a retired full colonel. So how many people in, ever become a full colonel in the United States Army? Having worked at the personnel headquarters, I can tell you, out of every 100 lieutenants we commission in the regular Army, not nurses, doctors, and chaplains, and lawyers, um, about 45 to 50 in peacetime, and more, depending on the combat situation, will become majors. That is a successful career for an officer. The Army runs on private soldiers. We don't run on officers. Um, of that 45 and that 100, 23 will become lieutenant colonels. Of those 23 who will become lieutenant colonels, um, about 8% to 10% will become battalion commanders. Um, JC was a battalion commander. Of that same 100, same 23, same 45, 5 to 6, closer to 4 to 5 for non-combat arms, closer to six for infantry and armor, will become full colonels, okay? And of that, 6%, I mean, 3% uh, will become brigade commanders, but the bulk of the brigades are in the combat arms. But there are a few brigades in the non-combat arms, which is what I was fortunate enough to command. And of that, 0.08% will become brigadier generals, okay? Um, so I feel like I had more than a successful career, and, and she did too. Um, and you just don't find many women that get promoted as far as we did. So just to clarify, you got her back to Arizona? And yes, then and then... She did not have the lung transplant. She, oh, oh, she did. So what, <laughs> so what happens is we get to... Um, so we got there on the 2nd of January, first around the 30th of December, 28th of December, something like that. I reported to her. My sister-in-law and brother flew in from Hawaii um, to help watch over her and, and help with her and help get us unpacked because I had to go to work. Um, and they st and my sister-in-law stayed for a couple of weeks and then around the, because she couldn't be alone. And then around the third or fourth week of January, it was getting time because Tricare had said they would approve her transplant around the first of February. And this is a really phenomenal story. So we made arrangements for me to come back and inspect that unit. We put her on a different plan, commercial plane. We both flew commercial, but the cheapest fare wasn't the one I was flying on. My friends met her with the oxygen that we'd left at the house, at their house. I had the oxygen that she'd been using at our house. 
she flew with oxygen provided by the airlines. It's, it's really complicated. Um, and she went in and saw Dr. Nathan, and um, I rent, we rented a car for her and everything. And 57 days after going on the list, she got the call. A boy had been in a car accident as a passenger, probably a, yeah, we believe it was a boy, based on what some people saw in the news. And because she was so small, and her blood type was AB positive, so she was a universal recipient because we don't try and type and cross match with lungs like we do with um, kidneys and hearts. So um, there, the lung being the most exposed organ of the body is frequently non-viable when we can harvest many other organs. She only needed one lung, unlike somebody with cystic fibrosis, so two people could be helped by those lungs. Um, she, she was in very good physical condition. We realized after her diagnosis that she probably fought this disease for several years, and it was probably what had killed her father, and it was probably genetic. Um, but so, so that was the 4th of April she got her transplant. Um, I immediately made arrangements to fly back, but I didn't get back for like 23 hours. I took the red eye, um, but you know, it's not like there's a lot of planes leaving out of Tucson. And, um, put one of my guys in charge, and um, did not get to see her before her transplant. Uh, they wheeled her back maybe 15 minutes before I walked into the hospital. But I was there in the recovery room when she came out, but again, we couldn't acknowledge, so we had to have a group of friends there, of course. And, um, and even in her obituary, I uh, just listed that she had several special friends, and several of my friends agreed, you know, some of her friends agreed to be listed alphabetically with me. So I was just listed alphabetically as one of her friends. Um, I was the, uh, so, so that was um, April 4th, and on April 11th she was discharged. Um, and uh, we, we began the journey of getting her adjusted on all her anti-rejection and other drugs so that she could move to Arizona. And, um, and that's a whole chemistry, and it really gets into the art of the medicine. And so by the summer, and, and I would fly back every other weekend to visit. Um, and so I would work uh, like a nine day stretch and then take a three day weekend. But I would have my phone and, and um, anybody who saw me in this assignment, I carried two phones on my person. Um, I had classified capability um, and I could preempt all the communications in the United States in, a, in, in the case of a natural, because of my responsibilities. And, and the doctor even said to me, he says, we've had Navy people who've been in this hospital. I've never seen anybody associated with the military. Be able I lived in the ICU when she was um, on life support the last 27 days of her life. And they brought me the classified um, that I could not do otherwise. Um, so the Army was very supportive but unspoken. So, how did, so what happened? So, so she came out the, the, for the 4th of July, which is her anniversary, her Independence Day, um, is what I called it. And, um, and that went well, so she went back, and, and so she moved out, this is 2001, remember what happens in 2001. So she moved out Labor Day of 2001, okay, so we drove her car, 9-11. We'd, we had a house off post and stuff like that, and, um, and because of, of my responsibilities, I could not go home. Um, I had to recover the Pentagon, I had to get soldiers into Afghanistan. There was a lot of stuff going on that I don't know if I'll ever be allowed to talk about. Um, but I had folks involved in the World Trade Center, th I mean it was... Um, People were, generals were calling from all over the world asking me if General so-and-so is alive. Because what was really neat is I had some soldiers on a field exercise in Virginia that I was able to send up to the Pentagon to start recovering all the classified computers and telephones and stuff like that, and all the classified media. And I had my combat camera guys that we sent in to document what had happened there. Then I had my red phone guys, you've heard of the special phone with the pre you know, and, and it, all that was going on. And, and for the first time, we were activating this facility underground that had been set up for in the case of a nuclear attack. And so I had those soldiers. And then we were going into Afghanistan, so I needed to send soldiers there. And because all the aircraft, so this is the funny story. So 
So anyhow, JC's stuck at home and she needs meds. And so Mr. Crutchfield, my um, exo, it was the first time I'd ever had civilians working for me. He went and got her ID card, he went and got her meds, and he took her meds to her. Um, since she couldn't go to the pharmacy and I couldn't leave the post. So, so anyhow, um, the other side of Fort Huachuca was the Military Intelligence Center in school. And so 9-11 happens and um, I have this intuitive gift where I know that this kind of stuff is going to happen. And so just like when we'd gone into a mission in Israel one time and a couple other things, I knew something was going to happen. So I put all my civilians through all these drills. So when 9-11 happened, as cr they, they had all the right equipment, which they would not have had a month before or six months before. And um, so this four-star general who's in charge of training in the Army shows up and wanted to know what had happened. And he didn't have the need to know, and so he wanted to see the general. And I come down, and he was pissed. So he calls my four-star general, and my four-star general says to leave her alone, because she's got a real mission, unlike you <laughs> asshole. So, um, and, um, so, you know, eventually what had happened was, so that was, so that was Labor Day, and then on the um, 4th of December, so she got her transplant on the 4th of April, on the 4th of December, um, she had an idiopathic, I had just come home from work, I was sitting on the couch next to her, and she had an idiopathic subarachnoid brain hemorrhage. Again, we don't know what caused it. So fortunately I was there and I immediately called the transplant line like I was supposed to and they, I said I think I need to call 911. So I called 911 and they were there right away and I followed them to the local little hospital. I mean this is like a little village hospital where we are. But there was this ER doc on that realized, recognized exactly what had happened, got a helicopter to air evac, stabilized her and got her air evac up to um, Tucson. And um, I had a great big folder I carried with her powers of attorney and my aunt's. Um, so I followed them up there and they were putting her in like neurology and I said no she needs to go to cardiopulmonary, at, you know, this was the University Medical Center, because she's a transplant patient and, and we've got to make sure we don't screw up her. But long story sh short what happened was she went into a little bit of rejection as a, a result of what they were doing to s stabilize that. So then we, so she gets discharged on the 11th of December but I got to be in court. So several of my wives, of my officers, go and pick her up, and one of my wives ran the pharmacy. And we had a snowstorm, because remember I told you I'm a mile high, even though I'm next to the Mexican border. So we didn't have the meds she needed, and the pharmacist drove a couple hours to get the meds that we needed for her. And they picked her up from the hospital while I was in court. So, um, so things got really crazy after 9-11, and my aunt deteriorated really rapidly. So I was flying back and forth, taking care of my aunt, taking care of JC. I felt that JC needed to um, be seen by her doctor because the guys at UMC just didn't understand her situation. My general didn't like being at the Pentagon, and it wasn't that I liked it, but it, my aunt lived in the DC, so, and JC's transplant team was in DC. And because things had changed after 9-11, we needed a general officer, and I was the closest thing to one, to be there with the vice chief of staff and the chief of staff of the army. So, um, so um, I, we moved back to D.C. in December of 2002 because I was concerned about where I was going to gain some, get some support as far as friends go out because I couldn't get it from the army because I knew she wasn't going to live forever. I, I knew we were walking a very, very fine line. So, 2000, April, so we moved back um, over the Christmas holidays of 2002 to 2003, and we went into Iraq in, I think it was April of 2003. So I was orchestrating something that we've never done before, which was a combat action that was actually done in the United States. And, and so I, I did that while I was taking care of then, so, um, which really helped us get Saddam Hussein, ultimately. Um, and so, she knew because of her last real job in the Army had been working at the Defense Intelligence Agency, you've heard a lot about that because of Michael Flynn. Um, 
and she was responsible for our current world intelligence. Um, and just like any married couple, you know, we did talk about some things. I mean, when I finally would come home, she'd go, he's sending us into Iraq, not Afghanistan, isn't he? And I, you know, I can't say, so you just, but you know, your partner can read your body language and stuff. So, I, you know, I really lived a lot of history um, throughout the Cold War and throughout um, each of the Gulf Wars and all the other operations from Grenada to New Finland or whatever. Um, and I felt really privileged. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all this with us. Now, so when you then retired, then you were, the first time you were really open and out. Yeah. But by this time, your she, So what happened was she died that year, in 2003. Um, we went on various trips, wherever she wanted to go. You know, everyone was very forgiving. And then, um, and we knew there was something wrong, but they could, anyhow, it, she, she, uh, and, she was, she just got, she had aspergillus, which is, 2003 was a bit, you, you do remember all the snow, and then you had a lot of rain in 2003, and you probably don't, but it was very humid, very moist, and aspergillus is a fungus that grows in the air that you and I have no problem with, but somebody who's immune says, so she contracted, and it's very hard to diagnose, and by the time we diagnosed it, it's not really treatable, for her, but we tried to treat it, so we put her on life support, and then I went through the battle of taking her off of life support. Um, so I put her on life support, she went to the hospital last time on the 30th of September, put her on life support 3 October, took her off life support on 25 October. Um, then I took my aunt and, and um, told her and stuff. So. And so I stayed on active duty another year and I just, could, you know, I could only do so much of my grieving, if that makes sense, and, I, and, all, and nothing mattered anymore once she got sick. So. Um, and that's why these generals didn't understand. They're all feeling really bad, I can't get promoted. They don't understand that life has taken on a whole different meaning for me. So then I just had to figure out how to put my life back together again, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had some friends that I'd met through Rochelle, my very first love, who had really stood by me. A lot of people, you find out who your real friends are, and, I, and, and some, some people just can't deal with someone who's dying, and some people can't deal with someone who's grieving. And, and I get it, I really get it. And, and um, I couldn't go to a support group, right? so I put myself in counseling, which she had made me promise I would do. And ultimately, you know, I was just trying, I got myself a couple dogs. Um, I, they're not with me anymore, they've passed on, which happens with dogs, it's the only thing wrong with them. And um, I was looking for, we had a four story townhouse, it was about five minutes from the Pentagon, I was looking for a place with land. So I was looking here, because of my friends, you know, they would joke. I didn't expect it to be here. And I was looking there any of my siblings, who I had a pretty good relationship with when I was in the depths of grief. Um, and then um, I found this piece of land and built a house. And where are you? What county are you in? I'm in West Yorba Township, up near the truck stop in Manitou Hill. I have a couple okay. acres. You're near a lot of dog training out there, too. But I, don't, I, don't, I went there one time, and I didn't like how they do it. So I am a dog trainer, among other things. But I don't go to that center. Well, now that you're retired and you can be free and out, are you doing? Are you connected in any way to any advocacy? I came here for a while, and that's how Pat knows me. Trying to, I've tried many different ways, and what has ended up speaking to me is my spiritual, mm -hmm. my what I call my ministry to these veterans, and um, you know, and so, and you know, and it's hard because none of them accept who, uh, you know. You know, if I were to tell them I was a lesbian and a supporter of somebody other than Donald Trump, you know, it would probably be pretty tragic for these guys. But the gifts I give them and their families through my dogs, uh, ministering to them. And um, you might say, why do I have so many? Um, it takes a lot out of a dog to do what I have them do. Um, and, um, and I counterbalance it working with these special needs kids. I tried many different things after I retired. Um, tried getting involved in um, various LGBT stuff when I was down in D.C. with um, this center that's down there. Uh, and I just, it just, none of it. And everybody that comes here is so much younger than me or so much older than me. Um, I tried different dating sites, so it's not like I'm not, you know, it, it just, the people I've dated have all been crazy. You know, um, because I think the ones that aren't crazy have given up on dating. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, 
you know, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but I'm Isn't just... Isn't there a women's group here, a book club yes, here? Yes, but they're... Mu I, and I came to it for a while, but they're probably a good 10, 15 years younger than me. Um, I'm going to be 65 in two weeks. So, and, and it's not that I, I have any, you know, it just... So, I just, I just kind of do my volunteer thing, and I have a lot of kids that, you know, um, follow me around like a little Pied Piper and I mentor some young men and and I just kind of find different things because that's just who I am. Great. Anything you'd like to ask? No, I think we're... You could Google me you'd find all kinds of stuff I did in the Army. But I wouldn't waste your time. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share? No. Okay, I didn't I'm... even know what I was going to say. <laughs> you know. But I knew you needed to have the lesbian twist. Mm -hmm. um, so you got it. <laughs>